Good afternoon. Most building and chemical manufacturers are getting away with murder, and they've been doing it for decades. They're not killing us with guns, but with toxic chemicals, slowly over time. <clears throat> we cannot fight them with bullets or politics, but we can fight them with knowledge by educating ourselves about chemicals. Hi, and welcome to part two of our webinar series entitled Toxic versus Non-Toxic, Can You Rely on Safety Data Sheets? My name is Joel Hirschberg, I'm the president of Green Building Supply. Thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be with us today. My purpose in this webinar is to expose some of the facts behind how toxic chemicals are classified and tested. This will help you understand that there's no straight line between what is toxic and what is non-toxic. <clears throat> Once you see how our government categorizes and labels threshold levels, you will see more clearly how we've been duped into a false sense of security. So first, I'm not a doctor and I don't have a degree in chemistry. I'm self-taught and have learned the hard way how to evaluate chemicals over the past 27 years from direct experience of using them, testing them myself, speaking with technicians, researching numerous websites, and mainly getting feedback from you about our products. But make no mistake, this subject matter is complex and it is very technical and usually only discussed by professional toxicologists. <clears throat> but I promise that if you stay with me, I'll share with you some valuable fundamentals that I've learned so that you won't fall into the same traps that most people do. It's my hope that after this brief seminar, you will pursue this a little bit to the point that you can figure out for yourself what products are safe for you and what are not. It will take some work, but it will be worth it. So buckle up and remember to click the ask a question button at the bottom of your screen and we will answer these at the end of the webinar. By the way, just so you remember, we don't, you don't have to remember everything or write everything down as this will, we will provide you with a download at the end of the webinar with some excellent links for you to begin learning about this important subject. So how do we identify the ingredients in a product? Well, we do this every day at the grocery store when we read the labels, right? Unfortunately, labels on building materials don't provide us much information or they're coded in language that is cryptic. It's not consumer friendly. The only place to find any significant information is to visit the website of the manufacturer and search for the safety data sheets, formerly called material safety data sheets. So what are these safety data sheets? They are forms that are required by the Occupational Safety Hazard Administration, also known as OSHA. You all know it, have heard of that term, OSHA. OSHA is, requires that manufacturers fill out these forms, especially if they're hazardous ingredients. And they're filled out by industrial manufacturers to make sure that their employees know how to handle the chemicals they are using every day. They were never meant for consumers, at all. They are voluntarily created. Nobody checks these safety data sheets for accuracy. And they're written in scientific lingo, mainly the language of toxicology and epidemiology. If we want to understand what chemicals are being injected to the products we use every day, we have to learn the lingo. So one of the first words <clears throat> to learn is the word hazard. Hazard used to be anything that was dangerous, anything that would kill you. But now with the onslaught of some 90,000 chemicals being used in industry, it has become necessary to nine different types. According to the Federal Hazard Substance Act, the term hazardous means anything that is toxic, corrosive, an irritant, strong sensitizer, is flammable or combustible, or generates pressure through decomposition, heat, or other means, which can cause substantial personal injury or substantial illness, 
during or as a proximate result of any customary or reasonably foreseeable handling or use. For simplicity, because that's not an easy thing to remember, they've depicted these nine types, these nine types of hazards in the following chart. These are pictograms, and you've probably all seen some of these, although they've been adding several every few years as they add new chemicals. The first one in the upper right is a health hazard, and that includes very different types of hazards, uh, many of them which are chronic hazards like carcin carcin carcinogens and mutagens and reproductive toxins. The second one is, has a picture of a flame, which is for flammables. And the third one is also a new one called an is labeled an exclamation mark, which is also uh, less toxic, more of an irritant, skin sensitizers and narcotic effects, respiratory tract irritants, and so on. And then moving down to gas cylinders, kill cylinders under pressure. Uh, the next is corrosion, exploding bomb, and oxidizers, which is a flame over a circle. Uh, aquatic toxicities, which are uh, the environmental picture there, which is hard to make out what that really looks like. I cannot figure out what that is. And then finally, the most commonly known is the skull and crossbones. This one is the one most people recognize because it is acute toxicity. It's fatal. When you see this, you know that there's death nearby. <laughs> okay. Okay. So what are the two main effects of these toxins? There's, there's basically two types. Um, the first is a short-term effect we call acute tox toxicity. These occur within minutes and usually enter through the mouth or skin from a single dose. We've all watched spy movies uh, when the bad guy opens up his ring and pours a little something into the glass of wine and Within minutes, the person drinking it passes out. That's called acute toxicity. The other type is the long-term effects are called chronic toxicity. This is different. These come from repeated exposures over lower levels of lower, lower concentration level, lower doses over a longer period of time, maybe months or even years. And these are mainly ingested through the nose. Okay, so the acute ones come through the mouth and through the skin, and the chronic toxicity, the long-term, come mainly through the nose. That's how they are described. Examples of that would be asbestos, nicotine, and most VOCs. Many of you may or may not be aware of this, but asbestos is a toxin, and primarily uh, in the form of dust, very, very fine dust that's ingested through the nose, and over many, many, many years, sometimes 15, 20 years, eventually it causes death. Uh, nicotine is also something that ha takes a long time. It's considered a chronic toxin. And most VOCs are in the same category. According to the Environmental Protection Associ uh, Administration, and I quote, adverse health effects have been reported about VOCs but long-term chronic exposures have not been studied. So they, they admit that they really haven't studied the effects of VOCs. They've studied all the really toxic, the really acute types of products, but they really haven't studied VOCs very well because it's hard to study something over a long period of time. It takes a lot of money to do that, and it's challenging to, to test humans. That means there's little or no data regarding VOCs, and they cannot easily classify or set threshold limits for workers or consumers. And that's why you don't see them very often. So let's look at chart number two, and we'll see how toxins are measured. There's a metric to this, and the most common measurements that are used are done on animals, unfortunately, and that's changing, but right now they still use lots of different animals to test chemicals on. Everything from mice and rats to hamsters to rabbits, all the way up to larger types of animals. And the two tests that are most common are called LD50 and LC50. These are the main ones, and you'll see this, these posted everywhere. What does that stand for? L means lethal, D stands for dose, 
and 50 stands for 50%. So LD50, the method of testing, indicates that the same population of animals is killed within a few minutes of time. 50% of the same population is killed within 50 minutes, a few minutes of time. So it's not everyone, it's just 50%. These are always a single dose, it's not multiple, it's a single dose, a single chemical, not a mixture of chemicals. It's always done orally or dermally, sometimes injected. And the unit of measure is in milligrams per kilogram of body weight, mg slash kg, or the skin surface, which is mg slash centimeters squared. And we're going to see this in a minute. Uh, why these metrics are important, because they're different based on how things are measured. The smaller the LD50, so the metric that you get for an LD50, the more toxic is the chemical. What that means is, is that if something is really, really potent, it takes very little of it to cause death. And this is how they do things. Tiny, tiny bit, a few drops, very, very toxic. So the LD50, the number will be very small. If the number is really high, then it takes a lot more of it. It's less concentrated, not as potent. LC50 is chronic toxins. The chronic toxins are tested uh, in multiple doses, and they are through the inhalation of air, gas, or vapors. So LC50 is the lethal concentration. The C stands for concentration, and 50% of the same population of animals is killed using this test. And it's always done in multiple doses through the inhalation of air, gas, or vapor, and it's also over a long period of time, from 4 to 14 days. So it's quite different. Um, it's also the metrics for this, the, the units of measure are in parts per million per volume of air, um, also, it's in uh, milligrams per liter of vapor. So there's two different types. And sometimes you're going to get one, and sometimes you get the other. And each, each company that measures these comes up with their own data. These, are, these two, the LC50 and the uh, LD50, are recognized industry standards used by most laboratories worldwide. They form the basis for setting threshold limits for industrial use, but they have some serious flaws. And we're going to go over some of those, especially when applied to humans living in a residence as opposed to, pe as opposed to people working in an industrial setting. In fact, many of the OSHA exposure limits are not considered by the industrial hygiene community to be sufficiently protective levels since the toxicological basis for these limits have, have not been updated since the 1960s. Okay, that's scary. That means that what we're seeing as exposure limits uh, may or may not be accurate because of the fact that the chemicals have not been updated for 50 years or more. Okay, let's look at chart number three. <clears throat> Chart number three is the toxicity of chemicals depend upon how strong something is, how it enters your body, how long and how often you're exposed to it, and how sensitive you are to it. Uh, the dosage or concentration is what has been for hundreds of years the main criteria for what makes a product toxic. In the 1400s, Paracelsus, who is the father of toxicology, said he was famous for saying, the dosage makes the poison. That was a very famous expression. It's used all the time. The amount of the dosage makes the poison. That's what LD50 and LC50 is all about. It's about the lethal dose that will kill 50% of the animals, okay, or the lethal concentration. The points of entry are also important. The dosage is one thing, but what we've found over many, many years is that there's other things that make a big difference. For example, when something enters the mouth, typically that's the most, creates most of the acute toxins come through the mouth. Uh, the skin, the eyes, and the nose are other points of entry. The acute hazards are from swallowing something poisonous or exposure to the skin or the eyes. The chronic hazards are different. They mainly come through the nose and are far less hazardous in general. 
Another factor in what how toxicity is looked at is the duration and frequency of the exposure. Hang in there. I know this is getting a little boring, but stay with me. It, it, it'll get better in a few minutes. But these are important things to think about. The duration and the frequency of the exposure makes a huge difference. I'll give you an example. Um, there is a product called crystalline silicates that's typically used in uh, thin set or grout or even drywall mud. And crystalline silicates are considered a California Proposition 65 cancer causing ingredient. And proposition and crystalline silicates are a occupational hazard because they occur over a long period of time. And you have to use them in a repeated basis for them to cause any problems. A one-time exposure of them does not have any effect, which is why crystalline silicates, which are classified as cancer causing, sounds bad, but when you analyze it and understand that it is a chronic hazard, then you realize that it only happens through the nose, only from a repeated exposure over a long period of time. And when you understand that these uh, chemicals that are analyzed on a safety data sheet are done in an industrial setting, setting you quickly realize, oh, okay, that may not be so bad for me. So we're going to get into this in just a few minutes, but this is, gives you kind of an overview of the different elements that make something toxic. Furthermore, um, the size, age, and gender of a species also makes a, di a, a difference. How big an animal is makes a difference. The age can make a difference. A little baby is going to react differently. The male and female is going to react differently. So the, that makes a difference in how we classify a chemical uh, toxin. Um, by the way, this might be a good time to stop. Just to remind you that if you have any questions at the bottom of your screen, there's a ask a question. Just look at the bottom of your screen and you will see there's a little ask a question. Feel free to, if you're wondering what did he say or what is that doesn't make sense, just write it down and we'll answer it at the end. Another element that hasn't been thought about for a long time was sensitivity within a species. For example, if a species, someone, if, if the animal or the human has asthma or allergies or Lyme disease or chemical sensitivities, that makes a huge impact also on how these chemicals affect them. So put this to wrap this all up in a different way. A chemical or mixture can be deadly in a certain concentration if it's swallowed or used for a short period of time by a young child or used by someone with disorders or sensitivities. But it can, be, it can appear to be far less hazardous in situations where the concentration is less if it's inhaled or used over a long time by a healthy adult. Now Paracelsus considered all chemicals to be toxins. And what he meant by that was they are potential toxins if the dosage is high enough. But this does definition also means that all chemicals can be considered non-toxic if the dosage is low enough. The glass can be either half full or half empty. Where do you draw the line between toxic and non-toxic? So let's look at the next chart. And this will show you something very interesting. This is the lethal doses of common chemicals. We don't normally think about water as being toxic, do we? But six liters, the LD50, the metric for this is six liters. That means, and this is, these are all for humans, by the way. For human beings, six liters of water are deadly for 50% of the test population. Um, <clears throat> that means if you drink six liter, liters all at one time, not over a long period of time. Remember, this is, these are for acute problems through the mouth, okay? Caffeine, who would have thought? Now, 118 glasses of coffee is not probably anything anyone is going to do, but they're clearly pointing out here that there are limits. If you drink enough coffee, it's going to have the same effect. Alcohol, 13 shots of alcohol with a 40% uh, rating of alcohol is going to produce a lethal result. And last, and this is just these are just a few examples. 150 crushed apple seeds have cyanide in them. If you eat probably 15 apples all at once, it may have the same negative effect. It can be toxic.
So how do you draw the line here? I mean, do you call water toxic? Do you call caffeine toxic? Do you call alcohol or apples toxic? No, we don't. We draw a line. We make that decision as to what is and what isn't safe. The government is giving us an LD50 metric here saying it's six or 118 for caffeine or 13 for alcohol. And knowing that is very helpful information because now you're not going to let your kids, if they're dehydrated, drink six liters of water after a sports event, right? You're going to say, just cool it. Just drink one or two or three at the most. So this information can be useful. Now we're going to kind of show you how to use this information on chart five. This is where it all comes together. And this is an important chart because it's used by all industries and all chemists all over the world uh, because they put this on to perspective. They take what everything is we're looking at in terms of toxicity and we break it down into categories one, two, three, and four. I think there's even a five now. These categories are broken down by the first one, as you'll see, is skull and crossbones, dangerous, extremely toxic. Second category is highly toxic. Third is moderately toxic, and the fourth is slightly toxic. And they define those with pictures to make it easy to understand, and you can refer to those because we went over those previously. But then on the left-hand margin, you will see how this relates to the exposure routes. In other words, how, it was, how the chemical was taken in. It seems to make a huge difference. For example, the same product that's, that's taken in orally, five, it shows five there in the first column. You see that? It says five milligrams per kilogram. The next column says five to 50 to the right, and then 50 to 300 and 300 to 2,000. So the, the, this shows that the five is the most potent. And when you, eat, when you, when you uh, take in orally uh, a product, that is less than five milligrams per kilogram and it kills you, it's category one. So anything that's labeled a category one <clears throat> is considered the worst. So if you see a category one, walk away. If you see a category two, walk away. If you see a category three, you might want to wink at it and then walk away. I usually, we don't usually even look at anything that's in those first three categories. Um, because they're just not, they're, they're, the warnings are too severe. When you look down at the next row, the dermal, in other words, things that are absorbed through the skin, you'll see that they're slightly different. So how you take something into the body, the quantity of it makes a difference in terms of the toxicity. So if you look in, a, for example, on the second row, in the fourth column, a thousand milligrams per kilogram, if you took that through the skin, that was considered a category four, but it's also a category four on the oral. Um, that's not a very good example. Um, perhaps in the third column called category, you know, those actually all do line up. I might, forgive me for that. Um, on the third row is the inhalation of gases. And these you'll see are measured in parts per, parts per million of volume. So the first two rows of oral and dermal, remember these are LD50s, and the next three rows, the inhalation from gases, vapors, and dusts, are all measured in parts per million or milligrams per liter. And you'll see that the numbers are all different there. They don't relate to the first columns. Okay, this chart we're going to be referring to because this is what you can save, and then whenever you look at a, a safety data sheet and it tells you that it's got a certain LD value of X, you can then compare it to this chart and see whether it's a category one, two, three, or four. And this makes it relatively easy, but you still have to have your heads up about this. So let's take an example. In chart five, we're gonna look at an example of a safety data sheet. This is a safety data sheet from Liquid Nails Construction Adhesive. Okay, you may have all heard of this. It's very commonly used, and if you look at the, there are 16 points that are on material safety data sheets and on safety data sheets. This is a little old, but it's still 
visible on the internet so you can see these sheets. There's not that much difference between a safety data sheet and a material safety data sheet. They use the same numbers, but they simplify things a little bit. So in point number one is the product and company identification. And the most important items that we look at are in number two and three, which is the hazard identification and the ingredients. So we're going to focus on these for a little bit. Number two says hazard identification, the physical state. It says it's a liquid. In this particular case, the signal word is danger. And then there's a hazard statement and a precautionary measure below that. So you need to read these carefully because they do to tell you exactly what's going on with this product. Extremely flammable liquid and vapor, harmful if swallowed, causes respiratory tract, eye and skin irritation, contains material that may cause target organ damage based on animal data. Okay. Cancer hazard contains material which can cause cancer. Now keep in mind, this is all based on animal testing. This is something that is for industrial settings. Okay. Let's scroll down a little further. They'll show you the potential acute health effects through inhalation, ingestion, skin and eyes, and they say irritating the respiratory system, toxic if swallowed, irritating the skin, irritating the eyes, and then the potential chronic long-term effects. So you can then analyze both of these. Let's scroll down to number three, and here's where you'll see the composition or information on the ingredients. And number three, you'll see it's a listing of all the ingredients which they are required to list. Mind you, this is not all the ingredients. There's far more ingredients, but these are the only ones that they have to list. And only, these are the only ingredients that are on the, <clears throat> the Toxic Substance Control Act of 1976 list of hazards, and there's only 250 on that list currently. That is changing but all these made it on the list. If it's a proprietary ingredient, it doesn't have to go on this list. If it's not a known hazard, it doesn't have to go on this list. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at kaolin, limestone, petroleum resins, heptane, benzene, and so on. You can look at any one of these and you can analyze what's in each one of these by taking the CAS number on the right. There's a column there that gives you a number. That number, you can copy and paste that into your browser and then write SDS after it, and then you can actually see what's going on with that specific chemical. So now let's, you'll see, now let's scroll down and we'll go through a few of these first measures. This gives you basic information. Imagine you're in a, uh, working in a factory and you spill some of this or you get some of this on your skin, you want to know how to take care of it. If there's a fire, you want to know what to do. This explains how to deal with that. Accidental release measures, number six. Handling and storage, how to store it and keep it. And then eight is exposure controls, personal protection. This one actually gives you information about how, the, how this affects humans. And it gives you uh, uh, exposure limits that were created on each individual chemical. So for kaolin, for limestone, for heptane, for cyclohexane, there are exposure limits that are given here. And these are supposed to be for human beings. However, these are individual limits. There is no, there is nothing on this safety data sheet that combines all of these and then tells you what the exposure limit should be for that product. It's only exposure limits for individual chemicals. Now, how do you know whether you have been exposed to that quantity of exposure, how, how do you know if you've been exposed to five milligrams per meter cubed at home? There's no way you can know this. In a factory, they have, they have instrumentation where they can do the math and they can figure out how much is in the air and they can calculate it. But at home, there's no way you can use this unless you hired an environmental consultant at 500 or or $1,000 a day and then they would tell you, yes, this is how much in your, is, is currently in the air that you're breathing. So it's not really a valuable tool. It's interesting to look at, but it's hard to interpret. Okay, let's scroll down to number nine. Number nine is where you will see the VOC content. 
There are also other chemical and physical properties. Uh, it says it's a liquid. It says that it's has a boiling point of 83 degrees and so on. Most of these don't mean a whole lot, but when you get to the bottom, it usually lists the volatile organic compounds. And in this case, it says they're 404 grams per liter, method 24. Now, if you know anything about method 24, you want to research that. Where you're researching, you'll see that it's not a very valid method of of uh, research, testing any longer. It, it used to be, but they have newer and better ones. The 404 grams per liter is quite high. Most of you who are looking for zero VLC products will look at something at 404 and go, I'm, I'm not going to use that product just on the basis of that. But there's way more to the story, as we all know from VOCs. This is only one thing to look at, one particular way of analyzing the chemistry. And as we've just read from the EPA, this is not, they've not done any real testing on the effects of VOCs long term. Okay, moving along to stability and reactivity. We'll just let you read that one. Number 11 is the, the crux of the whole matter. Number 11 is the toxicological information. And this is where they give you the LD50 and the LC50 and maybe some other types of test results. These are just test results of individual chemicals that have been studied by different organizations all over the world. And there's no consensus on these. Sometimes they will list where this comes from and sometimes they don't. But they all seem to use a database of information about a particular chemical. So if you have heptane, if you're a manufacturer and you have heptane in your product and you look it up, you'll see the LC50 inhalation with a gas uh, by a rat is 48,000 parts per minute on the first line. Okay, you'll see that. The exposure is over four hours. So over four hours, if you take in 48,000 parts per minute and you're a rat, you're not going to live, or half of you won't live very long. So let's take that information, that 48,000 parts per minute, parts per minute, parts per million, and let's go back and take that number and plug it into the chart that we looked at previously. That was chart number five. Now on that chart, when we look at the parts per million, the inhalation of gases, you'll see category one, two, three, and four, and you'll see the category four is 2,500 to 20,000. So the 40,000 that we're looking at, 45,000, is way, way over this, okay, which means it's in category five or six or who knows what, but it's way out there. It's not that potent, okay? That's useful information. We can do the same thing with the LD50 oral. But I caution you to only look at the ones that are most relevant. Now, clearly, when you see an oral LD50 that has a very low uh, milligrams per kilogram, then you know, don't feed this to your kid, right? It's something you don't want your kids to be around something if it's got a very low uh, or a number category one rating. But if you see that the category rating for an LC50, which is what's taken internally, then you kind of know, okay, I'm going to be breathing this in. And if I do, then I want to make sure that it's as safe as possible. All you can see from this chart is what they've shown for rats. Okay? This is not a chart for humans. So all you can do is look on that category one, two, three, and four and go, okay, for, for animals, uh, this is a category four or five at best. Not, not so terrible. Okay, once again, make sure you put some quest look at the bottom of your screen and where it says ask a question. Be sure to ask them here. I'm sure there's some questions out there because this stuff is not easy to understand, I realize. All right. Um, if we scroll down a little further, we'll see more information about these products from different organizations. And you're welcome to just simply uh, scroll through these and see sometimes they say not available. In fact, quite often you'll see the term NA or not available, which means there's never been any testing done for the chronic toxicity or for the uh, carcinogenity of this product. Scrolling down through number 12, uh, you'll see more information about how this affects uh, the ecology, especially the aquatic ecotoxicity, and they give LC50 uh, and, and EC50 ratings for that, which are slightly different. Uh, they have a different 
format than what the ones we were just looking at. Uh, I doubt too many people are going to pay attention to that for their own health, but if you're interested in what affects fish and uh, animal life in, in the ocean, then you should look at that. Number 13 is disposal considerations, 14 is transportation information, and then 15 is regulatory information. And you'll notice that there are different regulations for different states. Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, they all have different, they all actually will analyze these and come up with their own standards for what they accept and don't accept in terms of shipping and what they regulate. Now, if you look at number 16, this is an interesting chart, and you'll see this sometimes at the very top and sometimes at the very bottom. Number 16 is the HMIS, or the Hazard Hazardous Material Information System. This is somebody's attempt to make this simple. And the, the, the somebody here is the National Paint and Coatings Association. And they have tried to simplify this so that consumers can look at this and go, okay, um, this is a two for health and a three for flammability and a zero for physical hazards. That sounds pretty bad based on what we were looking at before, but guess what? Their ratings are based on a different opposite system. Zero to four, in their case, zero represents minimal hazard and four represents significant hazard. So it's completely opposite of what we just looked at previously. The, the categories before from OSHA were one, two, three, and four, one being the most toxic. And in this case, it's different. I'm only pointing this out because it's real easy to look at this and assume that the standards are the same. They're not, it's a different rating scale. Now, at the very bottom of this chart is very important to read. It says, notice to the reader, uh, the information contained is based on data available at the time of preparation, and it, there's no warranty is, it says no warranty is expressed or implied regarding the accuracy of the data. They will not be responsible for the use of the information or any product, method, or apparatus mentioned, and you must take your own you must make your own determination of its suitability and completeness for your own use, for the protection of the environment and the health and safety of your employees and users of this material. So again, they're putting this all on you to figure out, which is like not easy to do, which is why we're having this webinar. Hopefully this will give you some indication of how to do this. I don't expect everybody to be able to do this from the first go around. You're going to have to dig into it a little bit, a little more homework and research, but at least this gives you some indication of how it's done. Now, let's look at one more. I know it's getting on here, and some of you may have to leave, but I want to just go through this next one pretty quickly. This one is a uh, material safety data sheet for formaldehyde. Next chart, you got that up? And you'll notice that this HMIS rating is right at the top. You'll see three for health, two for fire, zero for activity. So in the case of this rating, a three is, is not very good. Zero is great. One is okay, but two, three, not so good. Um, and this is why, because it's formaldehyde, right? And what you'll see on this section number one, which we didn't see on the, on the other chart, was that there's a synonym here called formalin. And I only want to point this out because when you're researching chemicals, <clears throat> should you decide to do this for a living, uh, you'll be able to see synonyms that are abundant for each product. Sometimes there's five or 10 or 15 or 20. And I think part of the reason may be that manufacturers create new names just to hide behind them so you can't look them up. But other times it can be very helpful to look them up by a different name. Okay, section two is where we have composition information on ingredients in this case. And you'll see there's formaldehyde, methyl alcohol, and water. And they give you the numbers and weights. And then right below that, they make it a little easy for you. They say the toxicological data for oral LD50 acute 100 milligrams for a rat. Okay, so you can take that 100 milligrams and refer that back to the chart, and you'll see that it is, what is 100 milligrams? It is actually a category three. Okay, if you refer back. You don't have to do that on the screen right now, but I'll just tell you that's what it is. It's a category three. So it's not as bad as you thought for an oral ingestion of this product. But then they give you a mouse. Now check this out. For a rat, it was 100 milligrams per kilogram. For a mouse, 260. I'm sorry, uh, 42 
much less. And for a guinea pig, it was 260. So different animals have different, you know, the, the effects of them are different on different species. And then they go into the mist, a mist of this formaldehyde. We'll then do an LC50 test, which is acute. And you'll notice that it says 454,000 milligrams per meter, which is way off the charts, typically, which means it's way off in category four or five or beyond. Very interesting. Not as bad as we thought. So you can go through these, and sometimes you have to go through several of them to see which ones actually you want to focus on, but they're all there. This is the data that's available to manufacturers that they'll put on the safety data sheets for you to look at and then figure out on your own. So most people will just go by what's at the top of the chart. They'll see health of three and go, okay, I'm done. I'm not even going to mess with this product. And that's fine. And I recommend that if that's okay, that's great. But again, this is one, one way to look at chemicals. And we're going to talk about some other ones in just a minute. But safety data sheets are important to understand. They're not as necessarily what you thought they were. And they do show some of the potential acute health uh, effects and some of the crime. Second, and then if you scroll down to number, let's see, number 11, <clears throat> they talk in much more detail about the toxicological information. And they really get into depth there, which is really worth reading if you want to really know about what this product is. Um, but the numbers really tell the story. And you can go by the numbers because that's how everything else is based. The whole, basically the entire safety data sheet, green labels, uh, certifications that are done by other organizations, they all base their information on these, this data. This is it. This is the bottom line for products. And so if you don't care to understand this, that's fine. But if you really want to know what's safe, this is how you find out. Okay, now we can go and talk a little bit and summarize this a little bit. Conclusion, here's what to remember about safety data sheets. They're designed by employers for their employees, not for consumers. They're voluntarily published. There's no government oversight or peer review. They're not current, not complete, and not transparent. No one checks these for accuracy or reliability. And this is going to be changing in the very near future, thanks to Barack Obama, President Obama. The new rules that were put into place is going to start requiring checking of this information. There's no guarantees, so the buyer has to be aware, as we saw at the bottom of the sheet. The manufacturer can post or not post whatever it deems useful. Um, also, here's another one we didn't talk about. The upstream sources of chemicals can change frequently without knowledge or changing to an, a safety data sheet. In other words, manufacturers are always getting their chemicals from different places. This particular products we just looked at had three or four or five, six, seven chemicals in them. Where do they get them from? Some of them are made by the company and some are purchased from other distributors. And that upstream distributor might be getting it from somebody else. That could change on a weekly, monthly, or yearly basis without them ever telling you on a safety data sheet. They don't change it every time they make a purchase because they don't have to. They're supposed to be nice if they did, but think about how much work that would be every time they bought from a different source. Um, the exposure limits are based on individual chemicals and not on mixtures of chemicals. So what we've been looking at are individual chemicals only. We're not really seeing the combined synergy of those chemicals. No one's really testing those. Um, the other thing that's important is that the list of chemicals are only proven hazards. That list of 250 I referred to that were on the Toxic Substance Control Act list. There are other lists, and I've listed those for you at the end of this webinar. There's four or five other lists of chemicals that you can look at that pretty much will lay out what is toxic and what isn't. But again, they're using some criteria for making that determination, and usually Somebody has to draw the line, where is it a category one, two, three, or four, to make that decision as to what is considered toxic or not. One of the things that safety data sheets does not require, which is interesting, is trade secrets or proprietary chemicals. 
if they don't want you to know about it, they don't have to tell you. They're not required by law. This is also changing uh, starting this year. Um, pesticides, insecticides, fungicides, even antimicrobials such as triclosan, these are not required for safety data sheets. So the safety data sheet doesn't include everything. <clears throat> Biological hazards or nanoparticles, right? Those we've all been hearing about nanoparticles, how great they are, but nobody really knows. The information is not available on a safety data sheet, so you have to look elsewhere for that. And finally, exposure levels for humans are extrapolated from animal testing. This is changing, too, to a more sophisticated computer, computer modeling approach and is using research from other countries to help, thank goodness, which is a great thing. So where does this leave you? If it leaves you, if you feel you're in a position of uncertainty and doubt, then welcome to the club. You should be skeptical of any safety data sheet. And doing your own extrapolation and homework is important, but it's also risky. And that's what building manufacturers have been doing all the years. They've been making their own determinations about this. They've been labeling things in a certain way based on their own understanding of this, this chemistry. They tell us that a, a certain amount of a chemical won't hurt you or it will off-gas quickly, or they hide chemicals that are proprietary from you, so how do you really know what's there if they don't have to tell you everything on the safety data sheet? Even the best chemists are incapable of making predictions about the safety of multiple chemicals without the human data to back them up. And they simply don't have the data, okay? The data doesn't exist. So what are they basing it on? They're basing it on animals right now. So I believe, and this is my personal opinion, there's a collusion between the and the government that prevents us from knowing the truth about what we are being exposed to. And the only way out of this, in my opinion, again, is to educate ourselves learning as much as you can about what we're working with. So what do we do? How do we deal with chemicals in our lives? We've seen that safety data sheets can be a starting point, but they certainly don't tell us everything and they don't tell us a lot. And it, you could be fooled by them without really studying them and becoming an expert. Common sense is important. And based on the precautionary principle, we should just assume an attitude of skepticism, and we should look at these chemicals with that are red flags and go, okay, if it's a red flag, it may not be proven, but yellow flags, white flags, I'd rather go for a white flag that has been proven or is a zero on the list. If it's red flag and they're just saying danger all over the safety data sheet, it's probably dangerous, even for us. Um, another thing we can use for evaluating products is the experience of reliable retailers who have used products in the field. And we're not the only ones who have tested products, but there are many others who have been using products for decades and be happy to share their knowledge with you. Consumer reviews based on our websites are also useful tools, although consumer reviews are often, you know, 50% are really good, 50% are not very good. Um, but they do tell you something, and if lots of people are saying this stuff really smells bad and it's causing irritation and I'm getting sick, then it's probably true for them, but we don't know to what extent they inhaled that. We don't know if it was on their kid or on them. We don't know lots of things. So you have to be careful when you listen to what people post on the website. Green labels, which are third-party certified, um, depends how the green label, what the criteria is. And you can read up on, there's about 200 green labels now out there that are posted on manufacturers' products, and these green labels sometimes are valid and sometimes really the standards are not that high. It requires a lot more research, but I will guarantee you that when you start researching green labels and understanding how they are based, what their standards are, it all comes down to the safety data sheet, and it all comes down to the LD50 and LC50 test. So at least you have some basis for understanding some of these. But really the best way to know if something is safe for you and your family, or at least what's tolerable for you and your family, is to do your own personal testing. And most companies don't offer samples. You go to a hardware store or go to a lumber yard or go to a you know, box store, you can't buy it, the sample. You have to buy the whole product to test it. At Green Building Supply, you can actually buy samples of almost every single product that we sell. 
which makes it easy for you to determine whether this is good for you or not. Really, ultimately, you're the one that has to make that determination. We've done our best. We've had decades of experience. We've had very good experience with almost every one of our products. And those that don't work out so well, we'll if they have any ingredients that are even questionable, we'll put that on our website so you'll know how to evaluate that. So that concludes what I'm going to talk about. And there is some very good information, very good questions that I'm sure that you've been asking all along. Let's see if we can take a few of those right now. I think you may have just answered this, but just in case, if we can't if we can't rely on safety data sheets, what can we rely on in a nutshell? Yeah, well, that was what I just summarized in the nutshell is um, using uh, personal testing for your own tolerance. Um, you can use green labels, you can use consumer reviews, you can talk to experienced uh, retailers, use common sense with a precautionary principle and you can use the safety data sheets or there's some new sheets that are being uh, published now called HPDs or health product declarations, which are a little more detailed, but they still rely on safety data sheets. And sort of the envir EPDs, environmental product declarations, they give more insight. You have to combine all this information and look at it as a whole. None, not any one of these will give you all the information that you need. The next question is a little bit off topic, okay. but let me just find it here. How to test for VLCs? Um, great question. Uh, testing for volatile organic compounds is something that usually requires a very expensive uh, meter. That's their good ones are hundreds of thousand dollars. I've seen. Uh, you can hire environmental consultants to come into your home. They're usually five hundred dollars a day to do that. But I've talked to a number of people who have used these, and I, I asked them, what was the result of that? Well, they give you a chart, and they tell you how many VOCs are in your house. Great, I've got 200 of this and 100 of that and 500 of that. What do you do with that information? You have to relate it to something. You, have, you need a context to know what does that. There is no context because there's no standardization for VOCs yet, like there is for these other chemicals we've just been talking about. All the acute and chronic information we've been talking about, this has been around for decades and decades. They've been researching these chemicals. But when it comes to VOCs, these are relatively new, and it takes long-term research and data, and we just don't have the data. So truthfully, even if you knew how many VOCs were in your house, it doesn't really tell you the whole story. It gives you something, but not everything. So I would be, be wary of just looking at that you should analyze the safety data sheets which are on the websites and then if you have further questions you can always call us and we can try to help you the best we can this is related to vlcs this ryan also wants to know how to do concrete staining with zero vlcs is that possible um if there is something please let me know <laughs> uh, we have some concrete stains which are available um and you We'll be, you can feel free to call in sometime. It's not posted on our website, but we do sell them, and they are very ultra-low VOC content, and they're safe products uh, for most people. You need to test them out just like everything else, but they don't have a lot of the really strong solvents or the hydrochloric acid in it that's in most concrete stains. The next, qu the next question is, I'd like to know more about cork flooring and how to ensure that we aren't getting toxic glues or any toxicity in the way the cork is made. Yes, that information is available online in the PDF downloads that will explain what, again, they will, again, you, you will see the information provided by the manufacturer. Sometimes they offer um, the charts that were done by uh, the scientists who did their safety data sheet. Uh, but usually you, all you're going to see is a safety data sheet. Even if you call the manufacturer and ask to talk to the technical support team, you're not going to get anybody who really knows that answer. Um, we've done some research like that. I, I usually call and talk to um, some of these technical people all the time, and it's an interesting discussion, a very long one usually. And uh, sometimes that information will then come, make it back to our 
pages of our website, but sometimes we have to call in just to find out all those little bit of detail. We just know from our experience of using it that we people who are chemically sensitive can tolerate it. We've had really good experience with the products. But the actual EOC content, the actual chemicals in it, uh, are usually posted there if, if they're known. You know, hopefully in the next few years, uh, if we get an administration that can, you know, require that manufacturers actually become more transparent, we might actually get a, a data sheet, a safety data sheet that really is for safety, for humans. And that's what we really need, and we've never had that. Gabriella also asks about vinyl flooring. Uh, she's come across a vinyl flooring that's also certified green and environmentally safe, but it's confused because the question is, isn't PVC toxic to make? Yeah, um, PVC is toxic to make. It's also toxic to incinerate. Uh, when it goes into a landfill, extremely toxic. It produces dioxins because it's made out of PVC. And PVC is a known hazard in many countries. It's banned. Uh, and it's becoming a very popular product because it has some benefits to it. It's a very durable product that lasts a long time. Uh, but there are many issues with PVC. It does offcast when the temperatures become very, very warm, very hot. And uh, the effects of it simply aren't known. There's just a lot of unknown, questionable red flags being posted everywhere about PVC. Uh, because some people do claim that it bothers them when they're, it's exposed in their home, uh, just living with it. Uh, but the data on it just isn't there yet. There isn't enough hardcore data to prove anything. It's just lots of questions, lots of red flags. That answer the question? Okay. Oh, but back to the green labels. And I see you're confused because of the green labels. I get it. So because there are so many different types of labels, you have to understand that what a green label is. It's a pay-as-you-go program. So you want a label, you pay five or $10,000, and then every year they give you a label. You have to satisfy their criteria for that label, and as soon as you do, then you get the label. But they look at the safety data sheets. If you fall within the parameters that they've set, great. But you have to know what those parameters are. So that means you've got to look up the green label or call somebody and say, okay, tell me what your what what makes a product green for your company or for this organization. And then it will say, well, the VOC content's this, and it's got these chemicals, have an LC50 of this. Then you might have some basis for understanding what they're saying, but you will notice that they're making some very big judgments. They're making some extrapolations from the animal data to the human data and assuming that it's okay. Usually these companies don't take into account the chronic type issues that people have with long-term exposure of low level of VOCs. They don't take that into account. They only care about toxins that kill people right away. That's just been the focus forever. And it's unfortunate. But now with all these new chemicals, we have to start focusing and testing so we know the real impact of these VOCs on us. Is there a green label you trust the most? Uh, oh boy, that's a loaded question. I can't really promote any particular labels. Um, but... The you know Underwriter Laboratory, which which is Green Guard, uh, has been around a long time and they're very well respected. But there's four or five other good green labels as well. I'm more I'm more excited about um, products that don't necessarily have a green label but have a Declare label. The Declare label is from the Institute of Living from in Washington State, which has 100% transparency and is a an amazing. Uh, criteria for products. They, that declare label, we have a few products that use a declare label, and then you can find out absolutely everything about a product. It's all listed there. It still requires, however, even though they list the products and list the chemicals, you still have to look up those chemicals and look at the LC50 and the LD50 to make a determination. They don't do that for you, but at least if it, they have a red, what's called a red list where they have pretty much isolated all the chemicals that they think are hazardous. But again, they don't know you. And if you're chemically sensitive, they may not be factoring in your sensitivity. That's the thing that's so hard to, to really get and it's so hard to really know. Um, that's why you have to do your own testing. It's the only way. 
I, I, excuse me. From Daniel, I see a lot of no VOC paints at big box stores. It sounds like this can be misleading if they don't have to list proprietary chemicals. What can we do? They may not be bad enough to cause noticeable problems, but long term, what about that? Certainly could. And, and most manufacturers now, they don't have room on a label to get into the details about their products. You know, all you can say on a label, oh, it's green, it's got a green label, or it's got something that's got zero VOCs. That's good. That's a good starting point. I'm not going to poo-poo that. Um, but what do they replace those VOCs with? There's something because they have to keep certain chemicals in the paint to make it perform properly. If they take everything out, <laughs> it won't perform well. So also organic compounds are just the tip of the iceberg. There are many other chemicals which you should be able to look up on their safety data sheet and see for yourself what else did they miss. You're right. You're absolutely right. They don't have to tell you about proprietary ingredients, and therefore you can't really know through the normal means of talking to them or looking at their safety data sheets. You have to test it yourself. I know that's a pain because you got to buy the product to find out if it's safe. They don't have samples. So, you know, you can call the companies and you can talk to look around on the website and see what other people have said about it. And again, there's multiple ways of learning about products. I know it, it, it is, it is, you shouldn't have to do this. Nobody should have to go through this pain just to buy a can of paint, right? It's, it's not fair, it's not right, and we shouldn't have to do it. But this is the reality of what we're faced with today. How can you tell which product is safer than comparing two brands that both claim to be safe? Yeah, you have to look behind the headlines. You know, you gotta dig into the data and actually look at it. And then, try to analyze it yourself. There's, it's, there's very few people you can talk to who are going to be able to analyze that data and put them side by side and say, so you have to educate yourself. I know, I know, I know you don't want to do this. <laughs> Nobody does, but you have to do it because you're going to be buying these kind of products for a while. You might as well get used to learning about it. This way you can't be fooled. You know, you can't be tricked by someone just because they have a, a nice green label on the, on the front of their can right it's just education it comes down to education every time the next question is from daniel i understand that for drywall you want to look for nagging mine gypsum any other considerations or just get a sample of that batch and do a test and see how it goes yeah you drywall mud is you know again mainly has uh, it has a few chemicals in it that i'm not crazy about but Crystalline silicates is the one that is most talked about because it's potentially cancer-causing. But again, only for, with repeated use and only uh, in environments where they're exposed to it in, a, in a, an intense manner. If you're wearing a mask like they would be in an industrial setting, then these things don't have the same impact. Clearly, you should be wearing masks and you shouldn't even be in the room. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't use that product necessarily. Uh, because some products, once they add water to them, they're no longer airborne, they're no longer a respiratory problem, and therefore it's not an issue. So once you add water or once you paint over it, it's not anywhere near your nose, it's not being exposed to. So it's you got to use some common sense when it comes to some of these things, because oftentimes if you see, you know, those scary Red flags, they may not be a red flag for you. You know, that's the problem. It's, it's not easy. They haven't made it easy for, for us guys. It's not easy. So get used to that. You know, we're just going to, you got to dig into it. The next question, I need a list of non-toxic wall primer and paints and cabinet stains and clear coat finishes. Melanie is asking. Yeah, um, we all need that. <laughs> I don't know if I can answer that all in one breath here. Okay. Maybe we should answer that separately. Post the link. Yeah, we'll post the link to that, but we'll answer it for you. Next question. Um, this is from Mary. Can you say if it will be useful to people with severe chemical sensitivities? 
Yeah, I can't. Everybody with chemical sensitivities has such different reactions to things uh, based on the dosage, based on how old or young they are, based on how they're exposed to it. Um, you know, they're just, it's really, really hard to just say what's going to be good for everybody. Uh, uh, it's tough to draw that line. Somebody has to draw the line somewhere, and it's hard you know, to, to uh, because some, the, 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 the range of exposure is so different for people. How you're exposed to something. For example, if you, if you just open up a can of paint, smell it, that's one thing. When you put it on an entire wall and you cover thousands of square feet, the exposure to that is enormous compared to just a small, let's say, you know, working on a small little piece of furniture. So the quantity of it makes a huge difference. Um, but there are many other factors. Do you have good ventilation in the room? Uh, have you taken proper precautions like wearing a mask? Um, so there's a lot of things that you can do to prevent and to reduce the impact or the effects of these chemicals. And you just have to read. Many times on the safety data sheet, they will tell you what to do and how to, how to you know, prepare yourself for that. Because after all, that's what they're doing in the factories. Um, feel free to call us if you have any further questions about this kind of thing or email us and we'll try to get into depth of, you know, your particular product or your particular, particular situation. This is, going to be, this is going to be the last question today. Okay. Have you heard of the radiation prevention P98 paint? What do you know about this paint, toxic-wise? I haven't heard that specific product. We do all we do sell a product that uh, has some blockage of radiation, and these you know you just have to understand all about radiation. It's a whole other research product because all radiation is not the same. There's different degrees of radiation, and the paints may absorb certain amounts or block some of it, but it may not block certain frequencies. So you have to understand what those frequencies are and exactly what that product will and will not do. And will it do it over time? Because radiation is one of those things that just hasn't been studied. The effects of it haven't been studied on humans, especially low level frequencies and high level. You know, there's all these different levels of, of radiation. Which one affects you and how it affects you is just not well known at all. Okay. Thank you all very much for coming. I appreciate it and uh, look forward to talking to you or getting emails from you. And again, we will send you a, uh, a link to a document that has this, all these points on here for you, so you don't have to write them all down. But there will be some good reading material for you, and I hope that you take the time to read that. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you next time. Signing off.